Okay, can everybody hear me? It stopped working. So if everyone can hear okay, um, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. We've got some people here in person and we've got a few people online and we're here to talk today about primary sources for teaching and research in special collections. And for those of you who have logged in from elsewhere, um, we hope that this is a session that will um, inform your, your approaches to primary sources. It's going to be primarily based on what we have here in the building, but we, we hope that there will be things to, for anyone to take away. So I I know you guys are all here, so I don't have to convince you that using special collections is important, um, but this is kind of how we're starting out, is thinking about special collections as a laboratory. So thinking about it in terms of experimenting and learning and um, using this time as, as a in special collections is the time to research and learn through experience and learn through hands-on work with history and with um, literature. So um, we're talking about um, artifacts making us ask questions, um, making us kind of think more deeply about what's going on. Um, in primary sources, and so this is kind of all the, the things that we're going to be talking about today. So talking about our collections first, our collections are kind of small, but we do have a lot of great things that can be used for teaching. We have over 90,000 titles, and our item count is probably between 90 and 100,000 items. Um, around 1,000 original works of art, a small amount of archives, and 8 million microforms. And um, I'm not really going to talk about the microforms much today. We'll talk about that a little bit, uh, about how you can find them. Um, but for the most part, we're going to be looking at special collections materials, which are things that are original materials or historic materials. And just as it says there on the slide, most of the materials are for in-house use only, but some of them can be checked out. Uh, they're also open to all users. So the only qualification is a photo ID. Um, it can be a driver's license. It can be an MU ID. If you're affiliated with MU, we do prefer that you use your MU ID because we use the circulation system to um, track usage of our materials. So that's always useful to have when you come in. But if you're not affiliated with MU, there are ways that we can work with that too. So looking at some of our collection strengths, one of our big strengths of our collection is in writing technologies and the history of the book. And um, I'm showing just a few samples from, from what we have here. We have uh, some of the oldest things in the library, which are these cuneiform tablets, which you see in the middle of the slide here. They're about 4,000 years old, uh, the oldest of that group. And we have eight of them. We have um, a collection of manuscript fragments that we call Fragmenta Manuscripta. It's been together as a collection for about 300 years now, so that it's kind of a really interesting collection of fragments, just the provenance and the history of the collection. And that has been completely digitized. We also have uh, about a dozen complete codices, so complete manuscript books like you see in this image here. And that one it is the oldest one in the library. It's from around 1150. And it's a textbook, it's a grammar book. So that's one that I love to get out and show students because it's something that they can really relate to. It's something that they carry around with them every day. We also have incunables, which are books printed before 1501. So from the very earliest parts of printing to um, the very earliest years of printing to about 1501 is kind of the arbitrary cutoff for that. And that beautiful initial that you're seeing there is actually from a printed Bible. So it shows 
that there is a lot of overlap between manuscript traditions and early printing and printed traditions and that this, this overlap carries on for a really long time. So I feel like these collections have a lot to tell students about what's going on in our own world now. We're in the middle of this big shift from printed books and printed works to spending more and more time looking at screens. And just as people in the past were, were involved in the shift from everything being in manuscript to um, you know, things being printed. And so it, 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 it's a very useful analogy to bring up when they're working with these things. Another big strength of our collection is our comic collection. Um, we have the papers of five cartoonists that have ties to Mizzou. Mort Walker is one of them, and you guys who are in the room probably all know about Mort Walker and Beetle Bailey. Mort Walker actually went to school here, uh, to the journalism school, and um, Beetle Bailey was kind of born on this campus as, um, as a college student originally, but then became an army private later on. So we've got more, some of Mort Walker's papers. We have a large number of original cartoons and original artwork. We also have the papers of V.P. Hamlin, who um, in, uh, originated the comic strip called Alley Oop, which is about a time-traveling caveman. So that one's kind of interesting to show students. Um, we have a collection of underground comics, which you can <coughs> see at the top here. And we have the papers of Frank Stack, who is a former art faculty member and it's also considered one of the fathers of the underground comics movement. So um, that's a really great collection for them to explore. We have about 4,000 titles in our, um, in our collection of just you know, serial comics. And if you think comics are serials, right, so Captain America would be one title, and then there would be various issues <coughs> of that title. So if we have 4,000 titles, that's a lot of comic books that we have in the collection. And then finally, graphic novels that are more recent we have as well. Um, the one on the bottom is a graphic adaptation of Kafka, and then the one on the top is kind of a sci-fi graphic novel. So um, it, it really spans a lot of genres. And the, those are really interesting for students who are interested in, in visuals and graphics, but also students who are interested in literature, um, history. We have a, a collection of political cartoons, too, that didn't make it onto the slide. Um, and those are all original. So it, that's a lot of great material to use in classes. The next collection highlight or collection strength that I'm going to talk about is artist books. And these are just a few examples of what we have in the collections. Um, we have a, a really long list of what we have, not everything that we have, but just some of the things that we have on our website, which I'll uh, share with you later on in the session. But artist books kind of challenge what we think about a book. They, they ask, what, what is a book? Can a book be a work of art? When does it cross the line into not being the book? All these questions, how does this text interact with the structure of the book or with the images that come along with the book? And so I think these are really great for creative works, creative activities. We've had several classes of artists actually come in this semester already to use these materials. I also think they'd be really great for writing prompts, for composition, for looking at text and um, interactions between text and structure and text and image. I think this is a great collection to use for that. And it's really accessible because it's not something that you have to have a lot of background knowledge um, to get into. Another big strength of the collection are posters and propaganda. We have probably about 1,100 World War I posters and about 800 World War II posters. And these are all completely cataloged, which is a huge feat. So we have to say thank you to our cataloging <laughs> department for doing that for us. They're not digitized. We, didn't, we have not digitized our specific posters, but there are um, links in the catalog whenever they were able to find a digital image elsewhere. So you can kind of click through and see what the poster looks like if there's an image that's available online. And we have a lot of different subjects that are represented. Um, we also have several different countries that are represented. We have French posters, German posters, uh, Belgian posters off the top of my head. It's what I can think of. We also have a number of travel and tourism posters 
if you were around over the summer, you saw some of those on display in the colonnade cases that are downstairs. And this one on the right that is not colorful, that says patriotism, it's part of a small collection of anti-war posters that were published by the American Union Against Militarism for World War I. So those would be, I think, an interesting group of materials for a student to work on as well. And I think this is my last one. It might not be. <laughs> uh, history of science. History of science is one of our big collecting interests. And we have several of the landmarks of the history of science. And you can see a few of them here. We have a, a Vesalius anatomy. We have a, a Dialogo of Galileo. Um, that's our, the blue flowers there is our Fuchs herbal. We have um, just various early works on, on scientific thought. So I think these are really interesting, too, if you're thinking about the history of ideas or you're thinking about the history of science. This is a great way to show students what format these ideas originally came out in and how these ideas were circulated. Oh, and ephemeral literature. This is the last one. So this is a huge collection strength. We have thousands and thousands of pamphlets. Starting in the 17th century, that deal with the English Civil War. I think we have 200 pamphlets that deal with the Popish plot alone. Um, some of them are literary. As you can see, we have almanacs. Um, there are a lot of religious sermons from the 18th century. There are a lot of just ephemeral things that were never meant to be saved from the 19th centuries and the 18th century. And then to complement that and kind of go along with that, we have a small collection of political pamphlets from the 20th century. And you can see a couple of them there, the sabotage pamphlet and this pamphlet of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, which was, which was published shortly after, um, or not, sorry, not the I Have a Dream speech, but the letter from a Birmingham jail, which was published shortly after that was written. So um, this is a great resource for students to work with, especially the 20th century pamphlets, because they're accessible. They're in languages that they can read. Uh, a lot of the 17th and 18th century pamphlets are in English as well. So that's a, a big consideration when you're looking at this material, because so, many, so much of it tends to be in Latin or French or uh, German and not necessarily accessible to students. So I was going to kind of take you through. And just to, before I jump into this section, I do want to say that that's not everything. I mean, those are a few of the highlights and a few of the collection strengths. But some of the things I didn't put in was we have a, a great collection of theater. Uh, we have the papers of Lanford Wilson, who was a playwright, very important playwright. Um, we have a, a number of theater programs and theater posters and ephemera from the theater. Um, and that it doesn't cover the breadth and the, and the depth of these collections at all, but it just kind of gives you some starting points to work with. So I thought, how, how are we going to trace one idea through the collections and show you guys all the different ways that you could pull out one topic from the collections? And this is something that I worked with on Sandy Schieffer last year. She's the government documents librarian. So I thought I would show it to you guys again. So <coughs> looking for women's history in special collections. One thing you could start out with is evidence of women booksellers and printers in the 17th century. They definitely were there. There were a lot of them. And you can find them pretty easily by searching for their names. Just search for Mary or Anne. <laughs> and, and they will come up in the catalog. So there's one, and you could have a student work on these ladies and figure out um, who they were, who their families were, what kind of context they were working in. Or you could look at women's work more generally, women's work as in traditional, uh, traditional women's work in the home, right? So cooking and domestic manuals. But then who's writing the cooking and domestic manuals? This one is by, on the left, it's by a woman named Hannah Glass. And you can see the title page says H. Glass. Uh, this was an extremely popular cookbook and when she, when she wrote it. And for a long time, it was thought that a man had written this cookbook because it was so well done and so well put together um, that it was never credited to Hannah Glass or Mrs. Glass in any way. The book on the right is a domestic manual by Isabella Beaton. Is anybody familiar with Mrs. Beaton? Yeah. 
And Mrs. Beaton was kind of, I always tell people she was kind of the Martha Stewart of the 19th century. Um, and she, she wrote all these, she wrote her first kind of domestic manual when she was in her mid-20s. And then, actually, a few years after that, she died in childbirth. And her husband was the owner of the publishing company where she worked and eventually sold off her name to a different company who then used it to create this kind of Mrs. Beaton empire. So it's a very interesting uh, subject to work in. And you can see some of the original books in special collections. You can also look at women as readers. And this is evidence of a women's book society in the early 19th century. This book, and it's noted in the catalog, it's not noted as women because we didn't realize when it was cataloged that these were all women's names. But if you look, they're all Miss and Mrs. on there. And they're, what this is is it's the, the inside paste down of a book. Um, all of these people, it's, it's a book society. So it's a kind of a book club or lending library where they're, they're borrowing books you know, among this group of, of people. And so they're signing their names that they received it or that they returned it. And so you can kind of see that this is a long list of women's names inside this book from the early, early 19th century. I think this is about 1810. You can also use fashion magazines and women's magazines from the 19th century to kind of get at this question of what, what was expected of women during the time. You know, we talk a lot about the representations of women in the media now. This has always been going on. So how can we look back with that same critical eye and think about how women were being represented and the messages that were being sent to them in the past? And finally, our comic collection. We have women creators in the comics. We have women superheroes in the comics. But I got this one out because I thought it was interesting and kind of funny in an infuriating way. Um, this this comic from Punch from 1853, a humor magazine, talking about what if there were women police and this kind of idea of women's work and the role of women and what women are good at. And then 90 years later, we get this. And my one of my former colleagues, Karen Witt, put together a great exhibition of um, posters World War II posters. It was a few years ago, um, so I don't think probably many of you saw it, but it was all about women and how they were represented in World War II posters. And so there's a lot, actually there are a lot of women represented in the posters, and if you think about it, they're the ones who are at home during this time, so they're the ones seeing the posters. So this is a really interesting topic, I think, to discover as well. And I'll say another plus for the poster collection, actually, they're all encapsulated in mylar every single last one of them. We had, a, a, I think, a grant to do it. And so they're really easy to work with. They're very easy for students to handle, and they're easy for us to get out. So again, I would recommend looking into that collection as, as a great teaching resource. So I'm going to go over very briefly how to find materials. And I'm not going to actually go out into search into Merlin. Um, but Merlin is the name of our catalog. And if you go to this link here, this is the search link, and click on Advanced, that will give you an advanced search box. And you can put your search terms in. And then farther down on the page, there's actually a place where you can limit your search to a specific library location. And if you look in that box, you'll see special collections. So that's one way that you can limit to special collections and see just what's in special collections if you're interested in having your students work on something that's here. Um, and uh, you know you want to see what there is available for them to work on. The other way to find materials is through our website. We have a number of subject guides on our website. and collection descriptions, and all of the collections are linked to their Merlin subject headings. So if you go on to like the rare book collection description page, you'll see a link that says browse the catalog. And you can click on that, and it will take you out to the catalog and show you everything that's in there. 
um, and you can just page through or you can limit that search then to exactly what you want. So this is a great resource. Also, I will say here, you can see in this, in this um, top menu, microforms. So I said I wasn't going to talk about microforms, but I would show you where you can find them. That's where you can find them. <laughs> um, there are a lot of subject guides behind that, that menu choice there. So you can go in and, and browse those as well. And then, of course, how to find things. Well, you can always ask us. And these are our names. Um, Ala Barantarlo is the head of Special Collections. She is upstairs right now. Tim Perry will actually be starting with us in about a month. So we are anxiously looking forward to his, his arrival. And then me, I am Kelly Hansen. Um, here's our phone number. We actually do have a request form for classes. So if you already know that you want to bring a class in, you can go to this form. Sorry, the URL is so long. We don't have control over that. Um, but you can go to this form and it will take you out to schedule a class and ask you all the questions that we would ask you if we were on the phone with you. I mean, you can just fill that in at any time. And if you don't feel like filling in a really long form, you can always just email me too. It's not that long, but you can always just email me too. <laughs> okay, so we know how to find things. So now the question that I often get from instructors, and especially people who are a little bit newer to using the library is, I, I'm not sure what to actually do with this. Like, how, how do I get my students working with this stuff? What would you advise they do with it? So that's what we're going to spend the second half of the time talking about and hopefully get some ideas from you guys as we go along as well. What I always ask people, and, and it actually says on our form, is what are your goals? What are your learning objectives? What do you want them to walk away from this session with? What do you want them to walk away from this semester with? So, and how will it fit in with the rest of your course? So I'll, I'll put it out there to those of you who are online and also here in person. Is there, did you see anything so far that fits in with your goals for this semester? Sort of. <laughs> I'm letting the silence unfurl. In my composition class, you're talking about how we interact with technology when we read and write, and I can yeah. love that writing technology something because we can be really bad at that. Yeah, so writing technology, you talked about, and I'll just sum up for the people online talked about how we interact with technology when we read and write, so you could tie that in with the writing technologies. Anyone else? Okay. Well, we can think about that for a while longer, and then we can just kind of come back to it. So the second thing that I always advise people to do is give them an assignment, because if you if you don't, um, they will look around at all the great stuff that we lay out on the tables for them, and they will ooh and ah over it, and we will never see them again. So assigning them to actually work with the materials and get farther, you know, deeper into what they're looking at is, I think, a really critical piece of, of getting them to work effectively in special collections and in the library in general. So it doesn't have to be a research paper. People are, you know, kind of moving away from research papers in some fields. Um, creative works is one of, that's one of my favorite things to see students do with the collections. But they can also do some short research papers that you could just have them write a reflection. Um, or I have a number of observation activities on the, the website that I'll show you guys at the end. Um, that you can adapt for use in your classes, or you can come to me and ask me to adapt them, and I can do that for you. So assignments or activities or doing something in some way is, is a really big piece of what they need to be doing when they come into the reading room. The other thing is, is asking what skills or what literacies can we cultivate with this visit? What can we teach them by coming in, other than special collections exist and it has great stuff, um, can we teach them a little bit about information literacy? Can we teach them about visual literacy and how to look at things and how to kind of um, gather their thoughts on 
being confronted with a visual artifact, can we, can we teach them how to approach a primary source or how to work with an archive? Can we work on their writing and research skills? Can they do some observation? Um, these are all things that I think lend themselves really well to work in special collections. And I'll just show you guys one example with this. Um, this lovely piece, which is a facsimile of an original, and I have the notes, but they're not here. <laughs> um, but it's, it's basically a block book. So it's a book, um, a, a late medieval block book, early printing. And it was created as a kind of graphic representation of the Song of Songs in the Bible. So you can, so I always ask students, what does this remind you of? And they say, it looks like a comic. It looks like a comic book. And that is what it is, actually. Um, that is very close to what it is. So asking these questions, things that are related to artifactual literacy, what would this book have been like as an artifact? How would it have been produced? How would it have been used? How can you tell what evidence, what physical evidence is there on this thing? And this doesn't really apply to this particular piece because it's a facsimile. Um, but with any of the, pretty much any of the books in the collection, you could do this. Digital literacy. So what, what does it mean that you're looking at this on a screen right now and not the real thing? Um, visual literacy. Recognizing that this is a comic book or that this is a graphic, kind of graphic novel type format. What's the relationship between the text and the images on the page? Is this things that they're saying in these little scrolls? Or is it something else? Primary source literacy. Who created the document? What was their purpose? What was their point of view? What was their audience? And then information literacy, that piece that librarians love to bring in. How would you find out more? What's your first step in your research project if you wanted to find out more about this, this particular item? And that brings me to integrating, integrate special collections into this larger research process, into this larger research e ecosystem. Um, don't isolate. So, and all too often, that's, that's kind of hard to do, but all too often we say this is a standalone special collections visit, you're not coming back, or you're, you might come back and just do an observation on these things, but how can we work with the, um, the, our colleagues, actually, in the reference department and in the instruction department here, work with the subject specialists, work with your liaison for your department to do some instruction in tandem to say, how can we integrate facsimiles? You know, you can look at a pamphlet in early English books online and then you can come in and see it in person. And what is that experience like? Um, same thing with newspapers, same thing with fragmented manuscripta, which is that that collection of 200 fragments that I mentioned, which has been completely digitized, right? So you can see those on the web, and I have one up here, but then you can come in and see them online. Um, how can we work? What can we teach them about re research in that process? Um, what can we do, like bringing in classical text in, in translation? And I brought up the language issue. Um, can we work with translations and then work with an early printing of something. And then finally, um, this is really where you would want to, to work, you know, in, in cooperation with the subject librarian. It's finding out more, finding out how do you research this? What are the databases? And I can do some of that, but I know that, you know, Ann Barker and Rachel Breckis know a lot more than I do about all of these sources that you need to use for various disciplines. So bringing in your discipline specialist in addition to your, your special collections librarian, I think it's a really, really good collaboration. And then finally, um, well not finally, sorry, but promoting engagement. This is something that we see every day, and this is a quote from Ruth Knezovich, who is here in the English department, who brings her classes all the time. And I remember this happening, actually. Um, she, she writes that tears began welling up in one of her students' eyes because she was holding this 800-year-old book, which is the same one that I showed you on the, the writing um, technology slide. And she's talking about how she's part of the book's history and how that emotional connection is so important. And I think it really is important 
I think it's not something that we can can downplay this kind of wow moment or this um, this amazement or this real emotional investment in the work. And there's even been work recently in neuroscience, which I know is kind of one of my weird interests, but um, that says that actual joy and wonder and, and positive emotions like that in the classroom actually do promote learning. So if they're if they like it, they'll do better at it is what it boils down to. And that's something that they found in this Brooklyn Historical Society study too. They said ninety eight percent of the students said their work was unique and rewarding. And they did also find that the students who did the archival research did better, wrote better papers. And I've heard that over and over again from instructors that I've worked with as well. Finally, um, I keep saying finally, but it's not finally. Uh, we, special collections appeals to multiple learning styles. And that's something to take into account when you are designing uh, it, instruction or assignments in special collections also. It's how, how can we bring in the tactile? And that's kind of hard when we have a big class because often we say, please don't touch um, when there's a really big class. But what can we let them touch? So this is a fifth grader who came into the reading room just a few weeks ago. And I do have permission to use this picture. And she's not holding an original cuneiform tablet. She's holding a plastic replica. But she just saw real ones for the first time. And so you can, you can definitely see the, the wonder and amazement there on her face in a way that you can incorporate a lot of tactile um, and visual information, sense, sense information um, in special collections. You can engage with that. The other thing to think about is special collections, since it does have this emotional component, since they are working on things that they won't be able to find anywhere else, often they want to tell people about it. And so it lends itself really well to some sort of performance or pre presentation or publication um, format or component in the assignment. So I have just a few ideas listed out there of things that you can do um, with your students. And I'm using the fifth graders again. Here they are again. Because they came to us as part of a project in which they are making their own, um, their own country, basically. They're creating an island, an imaginary island. And they're having to come up with its history and its, um, its economy and all sorts of different things. So they, they came to us for a specific reason. But they're actually going to present these things at the end of their year. Um, so I, I keep telling the students and, and the, the people that come into the reading room, if the fifth graders can do it, you can do it too. Um, this is a great example of how people of all ages can be really engaged with this material and can use this material um, in a lot of different ways. And we can help with venues for publication and presentation, too. I can advise on digital projects. Um, we can host in a small way. Um, so you know, come talk to me if you have any ideas about that. More ideas. So there are so many ideas online for how you can use these things. These two books are really useful. These, this one, Pastor Portal, is all case studies of how, um, how different classes have used special collections and archives. And then the Using Primary Sources has, is full of um, activities that you can do in the reading room with them when they come in and what, what are the objectives for the different activities and how does that work out you know, into what they're doing in the semester overall. The National Archives and the Library of Congress both have really extensive teachers' websites. And these are geared more toward K-12 teachers. But you, know, you can adapt that and kind of make it more complicated or, or you know, kind of go deeper with it for, um, for older students. I put this Zotero here because there's um, an entire bibliography on Zotero about, um, about articles about teaching with special collections and teaching with the archives. And I have that linked on the website that I'll show you. And then finally, this Script and Manit logo is our blog here in Special Collections. And what we have done is we have periodically featured instructors who bring their classes regularly to special collections and ask them 
how, you know, what do you do this for, Why, what outcomes for your students do you see, what advice do you have for other instructors who are looking to start doing this. So you can go on there and look under Teaching Spotlight and read all about what your colleagues are doing and how they're using these um, collections in really creative ways. This is the website that I mentioned to you guys. And so it has just about everything that I talked about today and a little bit more. And you can see it's libraryguides.missouri.edu slash spec call instruction. It has a link to our form for requesting things, for requesting um, instruction services. It has more ideas about assignments, kind of some flushed out prompts and things like that, uh, sample assignments that we've seen in other places. It has links to a lot of other things um, that you can find online. So a lot of different teaching resources are all centralized there. And here's our contact information. Once again, you can contact us at specialcollections.missouri.edu. There's no appointment needed for research, but I've been telling people this semester we are, we are really swamped with classes. I should say we're really blessed with classes this semester. Um, we have a lot of them, which is so fantastic. But that one thing to note is that we do not have a classroom. So we teach in the reading room upstairs. And so if you walk in, we don't close the reading room while we teach. Um, but, so you can still walk in, but there it might be pretty crowded and that might be kind of loud. So you might want to email <laughs> in advance if you want to come in and do some really serious research. And then finally, again, here's our a link to our website and our section about classes on the website. And I'll open it up for questions at this point. Does anybody have questions or comments or anything that they would like me to explain further? Thank you guys for coming. <laughs> and um, yeah, and if you need anything, just let me know. For in person people, there are bookmarks up here. Oh, we do have one question, so I'll go ahead and get that. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Yeah, that would be great. <coughs>